Lucy will be launched in 2021. And Dr. Levison is well-known expert in the area of planet formation, the long-term evolution of the solar system, and the roles that small bodies play in detangling these topics. Let us all give a warm welcome, Dr. Levison. Thank you. Thank you. Let me make sure I'm properly uh, assimilated by my electronics. And that's on. That's on. Okay. That's working? Yep. All right. Uh, so what I was talking about Pluto. I could come back and talk, talk to you about why Pluto is not a planet. Right? <laughs> but uh, it's one of my things. Right? After all, I, you know, Southwest Research Institute in Boulder is where the New Horizons spacecraft is uh, is out of. So we have two of NASA's main missions going out of our office and New Horizons, as you all know, visited Pluto and it's about to visit uh, another Kuiper Belt object. I'm going to show you a little bit of data about that uh, as I give my talk. So the only time I've ever heard screaming in my office was over whether Pluto's a planet or not. <laughs> And uh, you can guess what side that I take. Uh, I think that was the excuse me. That was the professor's talking. The professor's talking. Uh, about whether uh, planet or not? Yeah. Well, you know, it's a good hobby. Let's put it that way. <laughs> to argue whether Pluto's a planet or not. Yeah, I noticed one thing though. They waited until Clyde Tombaugh was dead before they declared Pluto not a planet. I don't think it would. I don't think it would have mattered. Although Alan Stern would beg to differ, but I will note I will note that, you know, when when historically Tom Ball thought he found this oddity in the outer part of the solar system, and what he actually discovered was the Kuiper Belt, which is probably the most prominent structure in the solar system. So whether Pluto's a planet or not, he deserves credit for that discovery. Yeah. So uh, and I think, matter of fact. New Horizons got funded not because we were going to the last planet, but because we were going to the first Kuiper Belt object. Okay, which is another piece of history. Like I said, I could spend the next hour talking about what Pluto's a planet or not. Um, so um, I am the principal investigator, which means that I'm the one that goes to jail if, nothing, if something doesn't work, of the Lucy spacecraft, which is going to uh, go and study a type of asteroid that we call uh, Trojan, astro uh, Trojan asteroids. Lucy, is, our spacecraft is named after the fossil um, because we're going to ar we argue that the, the, this population is going to teach us about the history of the solar system. So they are fossils of the solar system, um, and um, it's also the fossil. By the way, was named after the song, right? Lucy in the sky with diamonds. I don't know if you knew that which is why our patch, come and get some stickers, are diamond shaped, all right? So that's how it all sort of fits together. So, you know, I was trying to decide what would be a good thing to talk about here, right? And uh, so I'm gonna talk about science, I'm gonna talk about why these objects are interested. interesting, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of the solar system. Actually, I gave a talk here 18 years ago right, on the formation of Uranus and Neptune and the structure of the Kuiper Belt. I don't know if anybody was even members back then uh, when I gave that talk. And so my history is actually as a theorist, right, and I got involved in doing these missions because I think currently the theory is outrunning the data, right, and we need some more constraints for our, our theories. And these objects in particular are going to be very useful, I hope. So, uh, but also, uh, you know, spread throughout this, every once in a while I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, how we did this, how Lucy fits in with NASA's planetary missions, and that kind of thing. So let me just start off by pointing out that uh, Lucy is a discovery mission. Discovery is the smallest of NASA's unmanned interplanetary spacecraft. Um, uh, there are three levels, actually. The Discovery, which is a PI-led, that's me, 
mission. Uh, we're cost capped at $450 million uh, through development, which means it doesn't include the launch vehicle or um, the science part of all of this after launch, right? To put us in perspective, Lucy is currently estimated to cost about $960 million. So a tad under a billion dollars. It still blows me away that they think they can trust me with that kind of money. But <laughs> they have a lot of people watching me now, so uh, probably okay. Um, the, th these missions are actually proposed, so it's a competitive um, um, environment where people from ideas from any kind of solar system target right, uh, propose, and then it, it's competed, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a, a little bit, um, down to choosing one or two from something like 30 that start. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys follow the his, what's going on in NASA's unmanned space program, but here are a list of various uh, missions that, that are part of the Discovery Program Insight is a lander on Mars, and it's about to launch, I think, next month, right? If, does anybody know that? The fifth. Yeah. The fifth? Fifth of May? Okay. And that's done, uh, that was built at Lockheed Martin, which is also going to build Lucy down in South Denver. Okay, the second level up is New Frontiers. Uh, this is also PI-led mission, uh, but it's not open to every um, tall ideas. There are a, a list of predefined targets. Here's a list of them right now. Uh, this has a cost cap of about $850 million. And then there are the directed flagships with you know, no limit in cost whatsoever. And here's a list of some of um, those missions from the flagship. I want to point out, you know, New Horizons is still flying, uh, right? It's going to go and encounter a Kuiper Belt object on... Um, January 1st of next year, Juno is currently in orbit around Jupiter, um, and OSIRIS-REx is on its way to a near-Earth asteroid, and it's going to do a sample return. Uh, um, let's see what else I can say about that. And both New Horizons, Juno, and Lucy all run out of Southwest Research Institute. So we've got about a third of the PIs currently active in the field. All right, so Lucy is a tour of... Um, the Trojan asteroids, these are asteroids, here's Jupiter, here are the four terrestrial planets, right, and they follow, lead or follow the Jupiter in its orbit. The way to think about it is if you calculate the gravitational attraction between the Sun and this, these objects, Jupiter, these objects, and the centripetal force of orbiting, right, it all balances out at these 60 degree points. So if you put an object there at the beginning of the solar system, they will stay there forever. Right, so these are primordial objects that we're going to be visiting. We launch on October 16th as the opening of our launch window in 2021. We have a rehearsal of a main belt asteroid in 2025. And uh, this is a really cool object in and of itself. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, we're, we're going to visit, five, we're going to have five Trojan encounters um, from 2027 to 2033 for a total of six objects because one of these objects, my favorite, is a binary. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the scientific motivation. I told you a little bit about my history of being a theorist, right? So a lot of this is going to be trying to put these objects in the context of what they're telling us about planet formation. And, but uh, I always put this bullet at the beginning to point out that we're going to a population that no one's ever seen before. Right? This is a totally unexplored population indeed right? of the stable small body populations in the solar system. This is the last to be visited. And indeed, we know nothing about these objects, right? We have meteorites. Somebody was talking about meteorites, right? We get meteorites from uh, the asteroid belt. We can get meteorites from comets, right, which are Kuiper belt objects. But this is the only population, because of their proximity to the orbit of Jupiter, that are not contributing meteorites to the Earth. So we know absolutely nothing about these objects yet. Now, if you look at this diagram showing the location of where the Trojans are, right, when people started 
discovering these objects, they figured what we're seeing is just the leftovers of the formation of the core of, the, of Jupiter. And therefore, people were surprised as we turned our telescopes onto these objects. They are not a homogeneous population, that they have very different physical um, characteristics seen from the uh, ground. For example, they have three distinct spectral types, and, spe and asteroids are classified by spectra. I have actually act added a little slide here for that, uh, having to do with their visible reflected light. And basically, you're talking about the slope of their spectra. So this object, right, this is blue, this is red. Uh, so this is a very red object. It's the reddest object in the solar system. We call that a D-type. Then you have sort of grayish objects here called C-types and P-types. And those are the three major characteristics um, objects that inhabited the Trojan swarms. And as, as I said, that's pretty surprising. Another way of looking at this diversity is what we call albedo, which is the fraction of light that these objects reflect, right? And so we, this is a plot of 3.4 micron albedo versus visible albedo of the uh, known Trojans. And um, you can see that these objects either go from really dark to incredibly dark, right? Darker than 4% albedo, right? It's essentially jet black, these objects are. But again, that's showing that they have very different physical characteristics. You can also do the same thing with colors. And this was a surprise. And I think what it's telling us is something about the history of the solar system, right? And I, uh, you know, in your introduction, you said that one of the things I'm interested in is what small bodies are telling us about uh, planet formation, right? And my analogy is a little gross, right? But I think it's appropriate comparing to this to a murder scene, right? And sometimes in a murder scene, the blood splattered on the walls tell you more about actually what happened than the body laying on the floor. And that's definitely true when it comes to... Uh, understanding the history and formation of the planets, right? The planets have been active bodies that have been evolving since they formed. So it's very hard to learn about their initial conditions simply by studying them. These objects are the fossils of the planet formation process and the evolution of the solar system. And in particular, I think what New Lucy's gonna help us understand is not only how the planets formed, and we'll get that understanding by studying their compositions, but also how the planets moved around. And that's one of the things that I'm probably most famous for in this field is the evolution of the planets. We now know, you know, when I got into this field 20 years ago, right, the picture of planet formation was that you had a disk of material with asteroids or comets in it, right, and the planets slowly grew by eating things near them. <laughs> Right? We now know that that's not true, right? that the system formed, um, the, the planets formed as a system, they, they um, moved material around, they handed material off to one another, right? and also they didn't form where we see them today. Right? Like I said, I gave a talk here 17 years ago, right? and my, the talk I talked about was what I said then was you can't build Uranus and Neptune where we see them today, right? And so now the current idea is that these planets form much closer to the sun in a configuration, and there are lots of ideas floating around the literature. I'm going to talk about one that is called the Nice model, right, which is my favorite because I'm one of the authors, right? Um, and the Nice model has, for example, that you had the four giant planets in a much more compact configuration than we see them today. So you had Jupiter, Saturn, in this case, Nep Neptune, and then Uranus, all within about 12 or 13 astronomical units from the sun. Remember, Uranus is sitting out here today. I mean, Neptune's sitting out here today. And we believe that this was su surrounded by a disk of material, right, that went just outside the orbit of the giant planets out to about 30 AU, right, which I call the Nice disk. Turns out if you put this configuration into a planet in integrate orbits for a long period of time, the system is remarkably stable. But after a period of time, 
What happens is the orbits go unstable, um, particularly the orbits of Uranus and Neptune go unstable. They scatter off each other gravitationally. One gets handed into Saturn, which knocks it out into this disk. And the disk just goes kaplooey, right? Think of, think of a bowling pin alley, right? And the bowling pin hitting, the bowling ball hitting the pins and things just go kaplow all over the place. And these small bodies get scattered all over the solar system, right? Some of them end up into the Kuiper belt, indeed Pluto, since we would like to talk about Pluto here, right? Is one of those objects that formed in this disk and got moved out. But a small fraction of them get trapped in the Trojan swarms with uh, Jupiter. Let me go back to the beginning of the, the I think it's that button, yeah. Um, we, the beginning, and you notice that we, this disk covers a lot of real estate, right? Half the diameter of the solar system today, right? The physical conditions in the disk were different. So we believe that the colors that we see in the Trojans, the different spectral types, result from objects that are formed at different locations and then got trapped in the Trojan swarms as the planets migrated. So this is a little picture of how that works. Let me show you an actual calculation that we did um, where here are the four giant planets, right? And here's this disk and you can watch. Oh, this is gonna take forever. It's gonna be this slow. Let's see if I can speed it up. And like I said, this is stable. And what's happening slowly as the, is material slowly le leaking out of this disk due to the gravitational influence of the planets, which is causing the planet's orbits to change slowly over time. And eventually they go from a configuration that is stable to one that is unstable. Boy, 700 million years is a really long time. <laughs> Just a question. Sure. Are you saying, um, I've heard this elsewhere, are you saying that the Jovian planets form first? Yes, we know that the Jovian planets form first. Really? Yeah. So, what, uh, well, don't blink now. I think it's... And the migration then actually starts generating the formation of the... Boom. There, right. we go. there I went. So Excuse me? So their generation, so their formation first and then the migration forward is, is what generates the formation of the support planet? No, no. So this happened really late in the history of the solar system, this instability. Right? I said around that that integration was about seven hundred million years after the solar system formed. So we know we know the the, the least Jupiter and Saturn formed first. Okay, and the reason why we know that is they're made up mainly of hydrogen and helium, which is the nebular gas. It's the same composition as the sun, right? right. And so in order for them to capture that gas, the, the gas disk had to still be there when they formed. And if you look around the galaxy at star forming regions, you find that those gas disks last about two to let's say five million years. So we know that Jupiter and Saturn had to form on that time scale. From cosmic chemistry, uh, chemical evidence, we know that the Earth, the moon forming impact that formed the moon, right, happened at roughly 60 million years. So the Earth took 10 times longer to form than Jupiter and Saturn did. It's one of those ironies that we have to deal with in this field, is that the biggest objects had to form first. You're welcome. Okay, so like I said, what we think the Trojans are are objects that are sampling from this disk, right? And that got trapped in the Trojan swarms. And so they represent, first of all, objects that are no longer there, right? Because the disk is no longer there, right? And they've just been conveniently stored in this region that we can get to with, this, with a spacecraft. So by studying these Trojans, they're going to tell us 
not only the chemistry that existed in the outer disk at the time the planets formed, but also how this migration happened through the mixing ratio here. So, you know, the Trojans, like I said, harbor these objects that form throughout the solar system. They're a unique opportunity to understand these models. And that's both a blessing and a curse, okay? It's a blessing because we have all these objects that form in different places real near each other so we can get to them, although they're not really near each other, right? But it's a curse that, because in order to really understand what they're telling us about the history of the solar system, we have to study a lot of them and understand that diversity, right? And that's exactly what Lucy was intended to do. So I'm going to show you Lucy. <clears throat> yes? Uh, the, outer the outer planets ended um, uh, somewhere around between, let's say, 12 and 15 astronomical units, okay? And the disk ended somewhere around 30, right? Which is why Neptune ended up there. It, it, it actually migrates through the disk until it gets to the end and can't go any further. That's why Uranus is where it is, according to these models. Are yes? Are sure that we know where these Trojan uh, elements are? Do, the location uh, of them? Do we know where they are? Yeah, we can see them. We can see them. Oh, yeah, yeah. And do we know the size? Uh, yes, we do. Which is? Um, the objects we're going to go to range in size between about 20 kilometers in diameter to about 100. The largest is about 400. How did we see them? From which mission? Oh, we can see them from the ground. Oh, we can see them from the ground. Yeah, matter of fact, I'm going to ask you guys to go observe them. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So, uh, I'm not sure you can do it. They're a little, they might be a little faint for you, but we need data. So, that's how I'm going to end my talk. Yeah. No, we're studying ours with a 24-inch telescope, right? Getting light curves and things like that, which we need to constrain the shapes of that. So Lucy, um, like I said, this was a pretty competitive environment. There were, I think, 28 proposals put in, of which we were the highest ranked. And one of the reasons why we were highest ranked is we found this amazing trajectory for the spacecraft that allowed us to go to not only a large number of objects that cover the diversity that we need to, but objects that are in and of themselves interesting, right? And so most of my talk is just going to be talking about what we know about our targets. But as I said, Lucy, uh, we can do this because of this incredible trajectory. So I'm going to start off talking about that trajectory. So we launch, uh, like I said, our launch window opens at October 16th, 2021, and it's 21 days long. And we're going to launch into a one-year orbit, right? So, so here's the orbit of the Earth, right? Here's the Sun, there's Lucy. Um, so we're going to swing around in a one-year orbit, and a year later, almost exactly, we're going to have an encounter with the Earth. So we're going to use the Earth's gravitational pull to slingshot Lucy's orbit to larger and larger distances from the Sun so we can eventually get out to Jupiter's orbit and where the Trojans are. So we're going to have a first encounter after a year. By the way, we can launch uh, into, directly into this orbit. So for some reason, we miss our initial launch window, right? Then the person who replaces me after I go to jail will be able to launch a year later into, um, into this orbit, which is a two-year orbit. We come down again have another encounter with the Earth, and then that's, this is going to scatter us out into uh, the Jupiter orbital plane, so we come out. Okay, first thing we do on the way out, we pass this asteroid called Donald Johansson, which we named after the discovery of the fossil Lucy, right? So he thought that was pretty cool. I got to talk to him, right? I was like, we named an asteroid after you. It's very hard to change the inclination, so not much, okay? And that's one of the things, I should say that this was an amazing trajectory that we found, right? But it was a combination of a lot of hard work by a lot of smart people, but also incredible luck, okay? 
And we, so we, one of the arguments we made is we, we came up with this trajectory with all these interesting objects, and then we told the same guys who designed the Lucy mission to go and say, let's assume we launch in 2030. What can you do? And they found four objects we could go to instead of six, and none of them were interesting. I mean, you know, what I like to say is I've spent my life doing orbital dynamics. This is exactly the kind of things I do, right, using uh, gravity and following orbits in order to build planets. That's basically what I did. I showed you one of that Nice model simulation was exactly doing that, right? And so I've been worshiping at the feet of the celestial mechanics gods for 40 years, and they decided to pay us back. This is really an amazing trajectory. So uh, one of the things about it is Donald Johansson, and I'll explain that a little bit when we talk to it. Then we head out into the Trojan swarms, and there are two of them, right? They're the L4 that leads Jupiter, and we're going to have four encounters in the L4. I can't see this very well. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, how do I do that? Okay. This one? Yeah. Oh, that's much better. Okay. Yeah, we have to do a better job with this graphic. So we're in the L4, right? And we're going to have four encounters in the L4. Uh, and I'll talk about these targets in a minute. And then we're going to take advantage of a dynamical oddity in our solar system. And that is, if we put an object uh, with an aphelion, which is the furthest distance from the sun, near the orbit of Jupiter, here's Jupiter's orbit, right? And at the, the perihelion, which is the closest distance to the sun, right? Its orbital period is half that of Jupiter's, right? And as a result, we can take advantage of, on the first orbit, if you go through one of the Trojan swarms. So it's going to fall back in. We're going to have, there's Jupiter coming by, right? Another encounter with the Earth. And out we go again. And now we're going to go into the L5, the other Trojan swarm, right? And encounter our last object, which, like I said, to me is the most interesting of the the, those guys, Patroclus, which is the binary, that's going to happen in 2033. And if the spacecraft lasts and we have enough fuel, you can just continue to do this until the, either I die or it dies. Right? And the way we're designing the thing, I think I'll die first. You're funded for just one. We're funded for this. Yeah. So it's the two orbits that we're funded for. So this is, this is our trajectory um, in a frame rotating with Jupiter. So you imagine you take that trajectory I just showed you and you put a camera up above the sun at 6 or 7 AU, right? And you have it rotate with Jupiter. So Jupiter stays in the same place. So we launch into a one-year orbit. There it is down here. Have an Earth encounter that goes into the two-year orbit. Have another Earth encounter by the way, the other thing that we can do is we can make the orbital period commensurate with the orbital period of the Earth, which means that every time the spacecraft comes back into the inner part of the solar system, the Earth is sitting there, and we can use gravitational encounters with the Earth to retarget to our next set of targets, which is how we can do this with a modest amount of fuel. Okay, so we come back in, we have another one. This get, we, launch, we launch it out to the Trojan Swarms, we pass Donald Johansson on the way out, we come out and encounter Euripides. Remember I said one of the things we have to do is cover the diversity spectral types, right? So Euripides is a C, then we hit Palome, which is a D, um, oh, I'm sorry, Palome, which is a P type, then two D type asteroids, Lucas and Oris. We fall back through, come back out again, and hit this binary, which is a p-type. So we're covering all the diversity that we need to, right? This last encounter, like I said, is the day after my 75th birthday in 2033. So, excuse me? 
the binary, and I'll explain to you why. I mean, it's just not because I think it's pretty, right? I think it's the most interesting. Uh, another way of looking to make sure we're covering the diversity, I showed you this plot before. This is the albedo with 3.4 microns and visible albedo. The blue shows the uh, diversity of the Trojans and the red shows our targets. So we're covering the diversity really well. Here is an artist's conception of our targets. Uh, the shapes are actually real as far as we know them, right? We get that from light curves, right? And occultations and things like that. We have occultations of um, the binary and hope to get occultations of all of them. So as I said, not only are we covering the diversity, but these are interesting objects in and of itself. And so I'm gonna talk about some of them and why they're particularly interesting. And I'm gonna start off with Euripides, which is the largest, by the way, I, I have no idea how to pronounce these things. So I just make them up, right? The, the advantage of being the boss is I say, we're gonna call it this. Okay, so Euripides is it, okay, but it's, I know it's not right, because remember I told you I was uh, the author of this Nice model, and one of my collaborators in that is a Greek guy, right? So when we started doing this, I called him up and I said, hey, Minos, how do you pronounce Euripides? He said, Euripides. I said, okay, Euripides. He said, no, 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 Euripides. And I said, Euripides. He said, no, Euripides. And then I just gave up. <laughs> so, um, so Euripides is the largest remnant of the only disruptive collisional family in the Trojans. So let me just explain to you what that means. Here's a plot of the Trojans in the L4 swarm, right? This is the inclination, the tilt of the orbit with we get with respect to the orbital plane of the Earth. And here's its eccentricity, how out around the orbit is. Right, and you can see these things are spread out except for this clump of objects right through there, right? What causes that is that you had a larger asteroid that was hit by something and it was broken up. And the fragments of that breakup because they don't move away from one another with high velocities, all have very similar orbits, right? And so these are called collisional families, and we see them all over the asteroid belt, right? But there's only one in the Trojans, and it's Euripides. Uh, the Euripides is the largest member of that. And we've never seen anything like this before, so we're going to learn about how the collisional processes that let the planet formation ha um, occurred by studying this object. But there's another reason why this is particularly interesting. I should say Euripides was the only one of the targets that I said I want to go there before we even started, okay? Because of this, it's odd history. Because Euripides is a C type, right? Remember I said we have C, Ds, and Ps, right? But let me go, I'm gonna actually go back to that plot right, and show it to you again, because I usually point this out and then I forgot. So these, these are little, uh, these are little, um, you know, uh, pi diagrams of the distributions. And if you look, I said they're DPs and Cs, but they're really half Ds and half Ps, and just a few of the Cs sprinkled in, right? Around 7% of these objects are Cs. So it's a little odd that Euripides, being the only, oh, no, sorry. Being the only um, collisional family in the Trojan swarms is a C because they're rare there, okay? So I think that's telling us one of two things. First is that these things could be so fragile that if you hit, let's say, a D, which is more primitive and red, right, it's made up of just dust, and you hit it and it goes poof and it's gone, so you don't see a family. That's one option, don't believe that one. The other one um, is that whatever makes the D a D is only skin deep. And so when you break them open, they look like a C inside, right? And if that's true, when we fly by these objects, the Ds in particular, and we see cr there will be craters on their surface, right, the young craters, that will look like C's, right? So Lucy is designed specifically to look for that evidence. 
The other object, I keep saying this is my favorite, it is. It's Patroclus and Mendonitius binary. This, these are two objects that are almost exactly the same size, about 100 kilometers from one another, that are on circular orbits about each other with a semi-major axis of about 700 kilometers. Okay, so this, this is a weird thing. There are not a lot of these in the inner solar system. Matter of fact, there are only two that I know of, this being the largest of the two. Um, that's, a, that's the space telescope. Okay, so you can see that they're about the same brightness. Yeah, yeah. And that we had taken so that we can uh, figure out the orbit. And again, I'll, you guys can help because now we know when the mutual events occur because of that data. But it turns out I said the rare in the inner part of the solar system, and remember, I'm a Kuiper Belt guy, so to me, an inner part of the solar system is inside the orbit of Neptune, right? But if you look out into the Kuiper Belt, and, and in particular, a population that we call the cold classical Kuiper Belt, most of the objects there are near equal mass binaries. Uh, and so to explain that, what that is, here's a plot. This is, I just added to this talk today. Oh, that's sort of crappy, isn't it? But what you see here is distance from the sun, right? So this is the semi-major axis of the objects, and their inclination. Right? And, the first, and this is the Kuiper Belt, right? Here's Pluto, which is just a member of the Kuiper Belt. And, um, right? and you can see the first thing to look about this is when we, uh, I got interested in the Kuiper Belt before it was discovered in 1990, well, besides for Pluto in 1992, right? And what we were expecting to find is this nice cold disk, a cold meaning that you have objects in nice circular low inclination orbits, like the planets, except for, well, right? Um, right, they extend out from the orbit of Neptune. And instead, it looks like something took the solar system, picked it up, and shook it really hard, all right? And the Nice model was probably what that was, but you can see there's a lot of structure here in, in the Kuiper Belt. And if you look at these different populations, right, they actually are physically different from one another. And in particular, from my point of view, the, 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 the population right in here, which is called the cold classical Kuiper Belt, right, is probably the only part of this is primordial, right? It's beyond the reach of all the planets as they form. And yet, when you look at that population alone, all this other stuff probably formed during the Nice model and were thrown out from that disk. But this population in through here is, we believe, to be primordial. And if you look at that population, something like 75% of them are near equal mass binaries. That's a surprise, right? And I think what that's telling us is that the first, and there are theories that support this, that the first macroscopic things that formed in the solar system formed as binaries, okay? And again, there are theories that support that and actually say that these things formed a lot like binary stars do, right? Uh, through a collapse of small material and because of angular momentum and spin in that, the cloud, you end up with two near equal mass binary objects. And if that's true, the reason why we don't see them close to the closer to the sun than the Kuiper Belt is because planet formation is so violent, right, that these binaries were torn apart, right, due to gravitational interactions. Again, if that's true, right, the Patroclus is a rare bird. It's the thing that survived. So by going to Patroclus, we expect to see one of the most primordial surfaces in the solar system. That will be cool. That's why it's my favorite. The, uh, the, the orbit of the binary is 3.1 days. 3.1 days. Okay. I right, remember Pluto's six. Right, and Pluto's sort of like this, although it probably formed in a different way. Another object I want to point out, just because it's weird, is Lucas. There's Lucas's light curve, right? Magnitude versus rotational phase. And there's a couple things to note. 
First of all, it's got a really, really, really big light curve, uh, indicating that it's, it's very flat, right? Axis ratio of 0.6 or so. The other thing which is really weird is that the rotational, its orbital, its rotational period is one of the longest rotational periods in the solar system, 446 hours. So to, to point that out, uh, I'm sorry, this is going to be a weird plot because this is rotational frequency, which means the smaller the number, the longer the rotational period, right? So rotation period increases downward. Think of it as a magnitude, right? Okay, which is backwards. Here are all the known asteroids with rotation curves here. Uh, this is well known. This line, for example, is indicative that asteroids are rubble piles and held together by gravity. So if you spin them too much, they break apart. That's why there's an upper limit. These are the, the real rocks, right? Oh, this is size, I should point out. So these are the small, the small guys are really rocks. But most asteroids are really rubble piles. And Lucas is way down here. We have no idea what makes these things rotate so slowly. My guess is it has a satellite and it tidally despun. We'll find out when we get there. Um, so, um, like I said, we want to do, we want to get diversity. And we're getting diversity not only in colors, but in physical characteristics. For example, these are our two P-type asteroids. And if they have the same density, their mass ratio is 160 to 1. Right? We have different collisional histories. As I already pointed out to you, Euripides is a collisional remnant. We believe the Patroclus Menonitius is primordial. And probably, if we understand the formation of these objects well, the little guys are fragments due to collisions. And so now I want to just end the discussion of our targets just by talking about Donald Johansson. Oh, you asked about inclinations. Remember when I was, when I was saying... What's Jupiter's inclination? Excuse me? What's Jupiter's inclination? Oh, it's a couple degrees. Okay. It's really... <laughs> something like that, yeah. Right? So... so Patroclus's inclination is 21 degrees, right? Matter of fact, the reason why we went to Patroclus, remember I showed you the movie, right? And we were just planning to go to the L4 in the initial planning of the mission. And the guy who was designing the mission decided to run the uh, orbits for a couple more times around the sun, just so NASA's very worried about planetary prote protection. It doesn't want its spacecraft hitting Mars or hitting Europa because they're astrobiology, astrobiologically interesting, right? So we don't want to be contaminating them. So one of the things we have to do is swear up and down and prove that we're not going to hit anything, okay? So he was taking the first shot at that and just extended the movie for a little longer. And he also threw down a couple famous asteroids just so we could see where we're going, right? And, and lo and behold, on the second loop through, I noticed that we were going really near Patroclus. And I got all excited because I knew what Patroclus was. And I said to him, can we get there? And he said, ah, probably not. It's got an inclination of 21 degrees, and we can't change the spacecraft's orbit by that much. So we're probably going to be either above or below it and not be able to get there. But it just turns out that, that like I said, the Slash from Mechanics gods, this, the the asteroid just happens to be crossing the plane of the ecliptic as the spacecraft is going by, right? The other, the other really odd thing is Donald Johansson and the thing we're very lucky because we just, after we got all the Trojans, we wanted a, something to practice on, right? So I asked our, our mission designers to go off and look for... Um, something in the asteroid belt we can fly by just to test to make sure everything is working. And it turns out there's one object that we can go by, right, which, um, uh, so we said, that's cool, well, let's, let's go and look at that. It's before we named it after Donald Johansson. Um, and it turns out it's an incredibly interesting object in its of itself. And I remember I, we had this number at the time, it was called 1981 EQ5, and I sent out an email, I said, we can go by this, and one of the people on our science team said, 
That sounds familiar. And it turns out it's familiar because it too is a member of a collisional family and um, that we can date. And we can date them in the following way. This is magnitude, absolute magnitude, right? So bigger is downward. This is semi-major axis. This is the family members. And notice this V-shape. And what's happening here is due to the radiation due to the sun, there's something called a Yarkovsky effect, that uh, as an object is orbiting, right, the sun heats it up and it radiates infrared ro light. And because it's rotating, it radiates the light in a different direction than the sun is, right? Remember, the warmest time of the day is mid-afternoon, not at noon, right? And as a result, it's, the, it's acting like a little rocket put on the asteroid, and the asteroid's orbit will change slowly over time. The smaller the object, the faster it moves. And as a result, if you start off with everything, let's say here, and they'll spread, and they spread more for smaller objects, and that gives us this nice V-shape, and that way we can date the family, right, by doing this. And this, th this family is only 100 million years old which means it's one of the youngest families in the solar system. And by going and looking at Donald Johansson, we're going to be studying one of the youngest surfaces in the solar system, which will, in of itself, be cool. Okay, so let me talk about some of the science we're going to do. In order to cover the kind of real estate we are and be able to go across the solar system and visit so many objects we are, these are flyby missions, right? We're going to be going past these things between 5 and 9 kilometers a second, right? So our spacecraft basically, right, I live in Longmont, right? It's 30 miles away, right? It's like 4 minutes, right? No, 4 seconds, I'm sorry, right? That's how fast these things are moving. And so everything needs to be pre-programmed, and we just have remote... Uh, instruments where you have telescopes, infrared, sp uh, and spectrograph, basically. And we're going to be studying the geology. This is a nice picture of Pluto, even though it's not a planet. This is, uh, this is actually also Pluto, uh, and I'll explain to you why you're seeing so many Pluto things here. But we're going to be able to get surface color and composition, right? We're going to measure their mass, so we're going to get densities, which is going to tell us something about their interior structure and we're going to look for satellites and rings as we fly by. Here's our spacecraft. Um, for scale, the hugging antenna is about my height. It's two meters, right? The solar panels were far from the sun, so we need really big solar panels. These are 6.3 meters in diameter each, all right? And we're going to have a scan platform with basically four instruments on board. Right? Uh, these are wide field um, panchromatic cameras, mainly used for navigation. We have uh, a 10 centimeter telescope, right? That is going to be used for high resolution panchromatic imaging. We have, uh, actually, Ralph has two instruments in one. It's a color imager, indivisible, and it's a near infrared imaging spectrometer. Right, which will go out to 3.8 microns. This, the whole purpose of Lucy is to get Ralph to these Trojans, right? Because this is where we're going to be measuring the composition with that instrument. And then we're going to have a thermal infrared going out to about 100 microns called TESS, which is uh, going to allow us to measure the physical properties by looking at the temperature of the surface. So we're going to get information about the grain properties and things like that on the surface. Okay. So, uh, did I hear a question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's the um, um, uh, area the size of Juno's solar panels? <coughs> they're, the, they're comparable, actually. Yeah. After all, we're going to roughly the same place, yeah. right? And they're being built by sim similar people, right? Both, both spacecraft were being built, or were built, or will be built in South Denver. I don't know if you, I'm going to, let me just finish with this and point out something about how incredible the Denver area is to this, to this field, right? We dominate everything, basically, going on between ULA and Lockheed Martin, 
you know, Juno was just built, right, 10 miles down the road, right? And so, and so will Lucy be built just 10, down, 10 miles down the road. Well, anyway, so I want to put Lucy in context, right? In the whole history of unmanned exploration, right, we have visited eight main belt asteroids, right? That's many missions over many years. And this study has revolutionized our understanding of the main asteroid belt and how terrestrial planets form through the main asteroid belt, right? Lucy, on a very modest budget, remember, this, we're the smallest of NASA's unmanned spacecraft, will study almost as many Trojans, six, as been, has been studied throughout history for the main belt. And we're expecting to get our understanding of the outer solar system revolutionized in a similar way. How am I doing on time? Okay. Okay, so I just want to tell you the story of Lucy. And uh, before I stop, um, so we started work on Lucy in March of 2014, right? There's, there, there's, I should say in these competitive calls by NASA, it's a two-step process, right? NASA can't expect people to design a mission well enough, right, to prove that you can actually do it without getting some money from NASA. So it's a two-step process. So we started work in March of 2014, submitted the first proposal, which was about 250 pages, in February 2015, as I already said together, already there were 28 other proposals submitted. In September 2015, right, they selected five for future study. We received about $3 million to help us, right? I would say when, what we did here, I, I mean, I'm sure the engineers in Lockheed would kill me if they ever heard me say this, but what we did is sort of performed Lego engineering. Okay, so take this and stick it there. Oh, that looks good. Take this, stick it there. But you couldn't prove that any of this was going to work. So we spent the $3 million refining the, um, our design. That led us to our second phase of competition, which is called the end of phase A. We submitted a thousand page concept, concept study report, right? Followed a couple months later by a site visit, which was the hardest thing I've ever done. That includes getting married. And um, I thought that was funny. No? OK, no, this was nine hours of being drilled by 40 people, right, basically. They sent 40 people who read the proposal, read the, read the concept study report, and every aspect was questioned and studied. It was one of the most intense things I've ever done. Then we delivered a science talk to the Associate Administrator of NASA in December 2016, and we were selected uh, for flight in January of 2017. So it was a long haul. Thank you. I did. I mean, we did. I mean, we won, right? We started with 20, 28 proposals, and we beat them all. So how can you help? Well, it turns out that the more we know about the targets, the more information we can get from them. And a lot of these we don't know very much about. So we are starting a ground-based campaign to study these objects, okay? And there's several things we can do. First of all, the, the binary is, remember I showed you those HST observations of the binary? We took those in order to get the orbit really well so we can predict when mutual events start. Okay, mutual events, are basically when the objects pass in front of each other, and you can see that happening there, right? So if you're measuring the brightness of the object, right, they dim as you move in front of it because you don't, they block some of them out. That's one of the types. And the other type is notice the shadow of one is falling on the other. And we can also see that through photometry. So we need to study these events. That website points you to uh, a list of when they should be occurring. And they're going on now. We are getting some great data. The more data we get, the better. Problem is they're, 15, they're 16th magnitude, right? 
So I don't know if you guys can do that, right? But we're, we're doing it with a nice CCD on a 24 inch telescope. So, I mean, you may not have that kind of um, uh, ability to study that. I'll get to that in a minute, okay? So uh, we also need just light curves taken at all phases as they orbit the sun, and from that we can get shapes and pole positions, right? And pole positions are particularly critical for us to know where they are, to know what our coverage is gonna be. So, and again, light curves for these objects would be great, except they range from 17th to 19th magnitude. I know it's pushing it for you guys, but I thought I'd point it out just in case somebody has a good meter-sized tel telescope. The third thing we need is volunteers for, oct uh, um, for occultation um, expeditions, right? We will be, we have 23 portable 24-inch telescopes. They were bought to support the New Horizons campaign, right? I said, right, we're gonna go buy a Kuiper Belt object with New Horizons in, on the 1st of January of next year, and uh, it's an object called um, 2014 MU69, and we already know how big it is by looking at these occultations, and what you see here um, basically are tracks of stars, right, seen in the frame of the, uh, the, the target, and what happens is, as they're moving through, they blink out as the target moves in front of it. Right? That's what an occultation is. And we will, these data were taken in, here's our telescope. That's our 24 inch portable telescope, right? Uh, like I said, we have 23 of them, so we need help, right? We don't, we can't pay enough people to go and, and babysit them, so we need volunteers. Uh, this was taken um, in Argentina, right? Which is how we figured out that this object we're going to itself may be a binary, looks like it, right? And uh, we will be, they're, they're planning a trip to study this again, to really prove whether it's a binary or not, to Senegal, which I think they're absolutely crazy going to Senegal, but okay, they're planning to do that. And we will, we will inherit these telescopes and we will be studying our targets with that. And if you're interested in volunteering, it's gonna take us a long time to get to the point where we're gonna be doing that. But if you're interested in going on to this, we'll play, We'll pay for your travel, right? Uh, email us at lucy-pub, uh, and we'll put you on a list, and when we get there, we'll contact you again. Will this be a uh, visual observation of these? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so they're just, yeah, they're just photometry of the star, and they'll blink out, right? That's the object moves in front of it. So that's it. <laughs> so, thank you. Oh, I have stickers, if anybody wants some stickers. All right, we got some questions. Uh, that Cody? Yeah, uh, Hal, I had one more question I was going to answer earlier. Um, the L Ralph and the L Lori and those instruments, are they called the L, obviously, for Lucy, and the Ralph and Lori, those appeared on the New Horizons? Yeah, I, I meant to say that, and I'm sorry I didn't, right? The, you know, for, for a mission this cheap, the way you sell it to NASA, is through its heritage, right? That is, the, the, it's low risk because everything you're planning to do, you've done before. So our spacecraft is based loosely on the Odyssey mission, which is in orbit around Mars, okay? The, uh, except for the electronics, the Odyssey's 20 years old, right? But the electronics are based on InSight, which is about to launch, and our instruments have all flown before. Two on New Horizons, which is why I was showing you pictures of Pluto, because they're exactly the instruments we're using, right? And one, one, the test, the thermal infrared has been on several Mars missions, right? And it's on OSIRIS-REx, which is currently flying. That's how you convince NASA you can do it, right? And they have the same names. So Ralph, right, Ralph and Lori, yeah. Yeah, uh, curious, uh, for, the, for the inclination change, uh, was that done, was that done? Designed purely from the Earth flyby, or did you have like onboard fuel that you would have? Oh, we have, we have uh, a main engine that we use to do the fine tuning. The Earth does most of the work, 
but it's, it is true that uh, the inclination actually turns out the Earth can't do very well, exactly. right? And so the spacecraft does do that through its uh, DSMs, the deep uh, space maneuvers. That's yeah, most of it. It's actually it's. Well, most of the mass of the spacecraft that launches fuel. Okay. Well, half. No, they're you. No, we we're using it throughout the whole mission. So, and we're not changing the inclination very much. The inclination of the spacecraft really doesn't change. Yeah, it's hard. Yes. So, yeah, so our, our, it's a little more complicated than what I'm about to say, but, but, so we had a cost cap of around $450 million, okay, and the mission will, will cost roughly $760 million, I mean, sorry, $960 million, $760 um, is without the launch vehicle, so the launch vehicle, depending on who we fly with, and we have no choice, NASA is going to assign us to a launch vehicle, right? It's going to be a couple hundred million dollars, um, give or take, a uh, hundred million dollars. And then the science is the rest of it. And we have a very expensive, or robust, let me use it that way, science budget because we're flying for almost 12 years. Okay? It's a very long mission. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, you said you were going to tell us how great Denver is. <laughs> well, look, I mean, so look at Lucy, right? Um, I said it's almost a billion dollars, right? The launch vehicle, the spacecraft is being built here, right? The, the science is being done in Colorado, in Boulder, right? The spacecraft in Lockheed Martin. If ULA builds our launch vehicle, which I hope it does, right, the launch vehicle is going to be built here, right? So there's a small, I mean, $150 million is not small, but a small fraction of the budget is being spent in our Goddard Space Flight Center, who's managing the spacecraft, and our instruments are build it, being built. One's being built there. Uh, well, two are going to be built on the East Coast, one in Phoenix, okay? But the vast majority of this is being spent here, and that's because we really dominate with the ULA, Lockheed Martin, a lot of these spacecraft. Remember Phoenix, remember LRO, right? All that was built just 10 miles down the road. And then Southwest, right? You know, we, we have a third of the PIs in the country right now. So, I mean, Colorado really dominates this field. Excuse me, and Orion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's Lockheed Martin, but that's being built down in, in Florida. Yeah, not here. Alright. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Alright. You're welcome.